That is one of the most iconic photos in the history of the sport. I started off making videos on Vine. So my career started in six seconds and your career ended in six <laughs> seconds. When we think of the UFC's biggest failure, one man comes to mind. The one and only Ben Askren. Ben Askren. Ben Askren. Ben Askren. He is a man who went to war with Dana White. He can go fight in ABC and, and on and Pluto for all I care. For me, the, the biggest benefit is not having to work for Dana White. That guy's a freaking scumbag. Was kicked out of the organization he ruled over for being too boring. Does it bother you that people call you lay and pray? A man who got knocked out by a Disney star and a man who stumbled on the biggest stage imaginable. This is the funky career of Ben Askren. They say you shouldn't take your work home with you. I'll try telling that to Missouri's undefeated 174 pound wrestler, Ben Askren. What separates me from a lot of people is, you know, they take breaks, they take summers off, they take weeks off, and pretty much, you know, I'm doing something with wrestling every day of the year. But Askren doesn't beat opponents, he dominates them. I just go out there and try to win, and, you know, from one of my two standing around, I, you know, go out there and wrestle the whole match, and, you know, it gets people tired, and by the end of the match, they don't even want to wrestle anymore. They just want to roll over the back and let me pin him. Even as a young college student, Ben outworked the field. He was driven, dedicated, and more than anything, obsessed. His passion for the sport saw him rise to an incredible 153-7 record. A two-time NCAA Division I champion, two-time Dan Hodge trophy winner, and widely considered one of the greatest college wrestlers of all time. After his dominant and spectacular collegiate wrestling career, Askren would find himself in the US trials for the 2008 Olympics. If he were to win this match, he would be headed to Beijing and the potential of an Olympic medal, the pinnacle and the dream of any collegiate athlete. For Ben, it was the only thing he had ever wanted. Askrim was decisively beaten by the Cuban wrestler Fundora, but his hopes of earning a medal were still not over. If Fundora was to beat his next opponent, then Askrin still had a chance of competing for bronze. Anxiously, Askrin awaits as the matchup goes on. He would later state it was agony having his career for the first time taken out of his control. His chance of a medal now rested in the hands of someone else. Elizabeth Merrill writes for ESPN that Askrin disappeared around the back to watch alone. Fundora is ultimately defeated by a Russian wrestler. After a short while, Ben re-emerged from the back to speak with the media. He was broke, his head was down, his chin was quivering, and then he began to sob. He said, I don't know what you want to hear from me. My dreams are crushed. The dream of any athlete is to sit atop the Olympic podium, and that had just been swept out from underneath him. After just two hours on the mats in China, Askren was going home empty-handed. Asked if it was inexperience in the new rule set that had affected his performance, Askren simply stated, I just wasn't good enough. I sucked. After an awkward pause, Askren turned and left, headed back to the USA. There was speculation that Askren might enter a new sport following the Olympics, a sport that was growing into the mainstream, MMA. And considering his bitter loss in Beijing, Askren was certainly looking for a new frontier to conquer. And well, being hung up on defeat, as we all grow to learn, is something Askren does not do. He had a new challenge laid out before him, to become one of the most dominant mixed martial artists in history.
In December of 2009, Ben Askren was announced as the newest prospect to enter Bellator. He was to take part in the Walter Waite tournament for 2010, the winner of which would have the opportunity to fight against the undisputed world champion. Askren had in just three fights and just a single year proved that not only had he the potential to compete at the top level in the sport, but also that his extreme proficiency in wrestling was something competition had no idea how to nullify. Askren was on a crash course to the pinnacle of MMA. This, the fighter out of the blue corner, is Ben Askren. <clears throat> I want you to obey my commands at all time, protect yourselves at all time, all right? Let's touch gloves, step all the way back, let's do this. Ben Askren looking for the takedown and he gets it. Gets in here. Thomas to he's in, and he's in all the way. I think to warn a 10 8 but we had a dominant first round by uh, Ben Askren. Another takedown by the 2008 Olympian. Season two, welterweight champion Ben Askren, ladies and gentlemen. Ben Askren was a force to be reckoned with. It seemed that no matter who stood in front of him, they had no answer for Ben's wrestling. They would crack and wilt under the pressure that he put on them. Ben had risen to the top, ranked number 7 in the world, and was a spectacular undefeated 12-0 against top tier competition. He had probably only lost a singular round in his entire career, and the question was, what was next? Despite Ben's dominance in Bellator, going on to win and then defend the title four times, the organisation had somewhat fallen out of love with his style. When Askren's contract came up for renewal, Bellator's head would release a statement saying that they would allow their dominant champion a chance to sign with other organisations. But the whole thing read terribly. The very organisation that was meant to promote one of its best athletes was essentially calling Ben boring and one-dimensional. At the very same time, pundits like Joe Rogan were pining for Ben to come to the UFC. Listen man, this guy is wrestle everybody. Yeah. I want to see if he could do that to the whole division. Like, when, when Ben was in his prime, when he did that to Koroskov, mm -hmm. when he did, did that to uh, Douglas Lima, yep. I was like, you gotta understand how crazy this is, that this guy can do this to everybody. Yeah. And you know, people say, oh, it's boring, it's boring. Like, no, 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 it's no, fighting. no, no, no. It's fighting. Yep. This guy is you imposing his style. They saw him as a man who could easily become champion, one to rival GSP. Ben clearly belonged and wanted to end up in the UFC, but Ben and Dana White didn't exactly see eye to eye. Is there a reason why you have no interest? Yeah. 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 I mean, you have, have you... They don't want him. Well, it's their champion. They don't want yeah. him. What, what does that say? I mean, what does that mean? I don't, I don't even care. They go out of their way to emphasize he's a one-dimensional fighter. And as you mentioned, should Bellator and Ben Askren get back into bed together? Does it bother you that people call you lay and pray? I don't really care about the people saying lay and pray. I want to finish because I want to make it easier for me. And here's the promotion that didn't even think you were all that, you know, well-rounded. And now they are back to promoting you again. 2014, you, you hashtag Dana White. Fat bald man's ego is too big. Ah, it's a good one, huh? I don't give a fuck where he goes. He can go fight in fucking ABC and, and on fucking Pluto for all I care. I wanted him to go to World Series of Fighting. I don't give a shit where the guy goes. I'm not here to freaking bow down and kiss your shoes. I'm making plenty of money. I have a great life. And if you want me to kiss your shoes, it's just not going to happen. And I guess if that's what it requires for me to fight in the UFC, it's just not going to happen. And, and I don't know, he's just, he's just not my kind of guy. After a few months of negotiation, his and the UFC's relationship fraying, and Bellator clearly not wanting him, Ben would be offered a new home. A home in an organisation that always has, and always will, want to see the best fight the best. Ben would sign a contract with one championship. At the time, it was the biggest organisation in Asia, but had its sights firmly set on taking over the whole world. Ben was an important puzzle piece. If they could secure a clear top 10 guy in the world, and an American with a fan base, then they would be legitimising their takeover. Ben was thrusted into the division, and his tenure inside the circle of one was more of the same of what had come before, unfettered dominance. Funky Ben, from the moment he signed with 1FC, this moment has been what fans around the world have been waiting for. Here. This is tight, but I don't know if this is going to be enough to be 
really to to make Ben submit. You see Ben's face. Uh oh. Ben's got to be. Particularly heavy blows, but they keep coming at you. Well, this is a little bit better position for Amosov to be in. Right over to Vasek. Oh, Ben's in on. Oh, that's it. Let's go. Oh, an arm triangle. Oh, an arm triangle. Suddenly jumped in. Okay. Ben's rise to champion in one and three year undefeated reign in the organization proved beyond all doubt he was one of the best in the world. Everyone thinks like martial arts is this really noble pursuit, which it can be, especially when you're coming up and you're trying to make a better life. But when you're older, it's freaking selfish. It is so selfish. I got a wife and I got kids. I could give them more of my time. I'd give the kids that coach more of my time if I wasn't so focused on myself being the best I could be, right? At the age of 33, and having spent almost a decade in the sport after a gruelling but legacy-defining career wrestling at the highest level, Ben had come to terms with the possibility of sailing off into the sunset. When a fight with Shinya Aoki was announced for the end of 2017, Ben confirmed that it would be his last. When asked about if he felt his career was fulfilled after never competing in what many people consider the pinnacle of the sport over in the UFC, he had this to say. The biggest benefit is not having to work for Dana White. That guy's a freaking scumbag. Like, even if he paid me triple what I'm earning here, which would be a, a boatload of money, I don't know that I can see myself working for him. He's just a, a terrible person all around. So. Ben understood this was prize fighting and nothing more. He had gone about his career in a particular way that had set him up for retirement. He had businesses, wrestling academies, but ultimately a family that he wanted to go back to. They were the most important thing to him beyond the fight game. In interviews, he did say that there was one way for him to come back and that was a fight with GSP. But many suspected that he would come back if the UFC came knocking as well. And considering how things had gone with Dana, it was never really on the cards. And so Ben openly and willingly accepted that this was his last fight, come whatever may. Yeah. And when you had your fair share of critics for your wrestling style, like your style of fighting, yeah. you feel like, do you feel exonerated now? You're a tiny on top of the sport, you're a world champion. Has it ever bothered you? I'm sure those critics are still gonna be critical. That's what critics do. Uh, but I've never let them bother me in the first place, so I'm not gonna let them bother me now. Aoki's bottom game is sublime. How will it play out? Legend versus legend. Our main event here in Sydney. Aoki jumps the guard early. Slams him down. Shaka Laka. And a big right hand from Astrid. Ben, satisfied with his career, hung up his gloves in Asia after going 18-0 in a dominant, one-sided career. And at the age of 33, he had probably done the right thing. It's something a lot of fighters fail to do return home at the top, unscathed and with a healthy brain. The UFC had barred entry for several excuses. He was too boring, he hadn't fought enough competition. Whatever their reasoning, it certainly soured hardcore fans of the sport who felt that a prime Ben Askren posed a real and very credible threat to the welterweight champions over the last few years since GSP retired. I didn't want to keep fighting guys everyone knew I should and would be. I wanted to fight the guys who so many people assumed I couldn't. The guys in the UFC over there on the other side of the partition. I wanted to fight the very best in the world. I wanted them to fight me. I was perfectly content calling it a career. I'd done everything I wanted to do in combat except prove I was the best in the world. I vacated my one championship title and retired from fighting with total sincerity, with one caveat in place. There was one little void left to fill. But unfortunately, that void would never be filled thanks to Dana White. When asked what he would like to be remembered for, he had this to say. I mean, if I got to pick the fact that, I, you know, I did it right, there's so many dirtbags and cheaters in MMA. I've, you know, I've never taken a PED. I don't, I don't even do, I don't do recreational drugs. 
Uh, I don't beat women. I, you know, I don't miss weight. I show up, when I say I'm gonna fight. I show up every single time. So I guess uh, just that that type of stuff. Whilst Ben had stayed true to his values and got in for competition and then left when the money was no longer an issue, leaving what he deemed a selfish endeavour behind, he would do so with a career somewhat incomplete, that lingering void in his legacy. He knew, and the entire MMA fanbase knew, he deserved to compete in the UFC. But alas, it was seemingly never to be. Ben rode off into the sunset 18-0, the biggest what if. fighter trade, the UFC will release Demetrius Johnson, allowing him to sign with one, while the Singapore-based promotion will release Ben Askren. Here's one thing that's going to be interesting, it is Dana White and Ben Askren have just never got it right. I think he's got a big mouth and a big personality. And then Ben Askren and I have had a very interesting past and uh... Ben, this has been a long time coming, I feel like. This was, it was weird, right? Because it's who, a trade? Who's ever heard of that? That's weird. I love the deal. I love it. I love the idea of it. It's just one of those things that organically came together and we made it work for everybody and here we go. We have Till, we have uh, Lawler, and we have Thompson. Till took himself out of the running because he ate too much food. Stephen Thompson, cry doesn't work on me, so he's out. So, who knows, it's probably Robbie Lawler. In an unprecedented turn of events, news would break of a trade between two top organizations. But the athletes in the deal were more than surprising. A former champion in Demetrius Johnson, who many considered the greatest of all time, was being swapped for Ben Askren, the former one world champion, and a man who had just recently retired. And whilst this trade is something I have extensively gone over in my Demetrius Johnson video, video, I'd never really concentrated on Askren's side of the deal. No one was more surprised than Ben, and after all the wasted years he wasn't going to wait around. Shortly after the trade had been made official, Askren was matched up against ruthless Robbie Lawler for about to take place in March at UFC 235. Robbie was a former champion, and a man who took years off a of fighter's careers as he bludgeoned them in bloodbath performances. It was a stiff test for the UFC debutant, and many felt that it was Dana's way of feeding Askren to the Sharks. But despite this, Askren would open up as a heavy favourite. There were high expectations for what this man was capable of, and Lawler was the person to prove his worthiness. But Ben was keeping a secret. His body was a ticking time bomb, his hips were worn thin, and bone spurs had developed that were causing agony during training. In his mind, he had 18 months to claim a title. This short tenure in the organisation had to be shock and awe, from the way he promoted himself to the performances themselves inside of the cage. He had to win big, to make sure that that title was in his hand within three fights. The phantom that was a whisper on the J podcast for casual watchers of the sport was about to explode into the mainstream. Askren's perceived beef with boss Dana White and his grating personality were about to make him a fan favourite. Your UFC debut, my friend. Yeah. How's, how does this feel? You're here. You're actually, it's actually happy. You're wearing a UFC shirt. I want to talk to Ben. Uh, welcome to the UFC, of course. Uh, I wonder what the emotion is like for you right now. I mean, here you are, a guy that, that couldn't get to the UFC, that, you know, Dana had some negative things to say about now you're sitting on this panel full of superstars in your first appearance so what's going through your head right now finally got this opportunity to prove the how good i am at mixed martial arts and i'm gonna take it and i'm gonna enjoy it the whole way so let's say on saturday you beat robbie lawler yeah then what because then you would have beaten the former champ people are going to want to see you in big fights and welterweight but obviously your good friend time really is a yeah. champion I'm so what is it well, I already got my plane ticket booked. One question for Dana. Dana, we got from Ben kind of uh, what it's like for him to be up there. What about for you? What's it like? It seems like you're cracking a smile, enjoying him being up there. What's it like after ben, uh, all this? Yeah, yeah, I haven't been asking. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's great. Listen, I, I, I'm, I'm the one that wanted to bring Ben Askren into the UFC. We, I made this decision. He's here. He's a UFC fighter. And uh, yeah, we're cool. I'm cool anyway. I'm sure I already heard I would, but I was more just going to force uh, a call out of Darren Till or George Masvidal, whoever wins that fight. He's one of the best in the world. You know what I mean? He's, he's undefeated. You're going to fight the best. You're going right into the, to the, to the top of the heap. Uh, you're you're going to fight nothing but the best here. So believe me, that isn't the first time I've heard that one. Believe me. He's making his Octagon debut, presenting Dan Fucking. He was on. 
Dana, is that really the best you got? Bring them, baby. Uh, I watched that finish like 10 times, trying to figure out what happened or w whether he was out or whether he wasn't out. I was pretty convinced that at one point in time he went out. I see an arm go limp for no reason whatsoever. And um, so that's what I, that's what I have to work with. The fight didn't exactly go to plan. Within seconds, Askren was spiked on his head and Robbie proceeded to violently pound him out, almost to the point of the fight being stopped. Joe Rogan's commentary rang true, stating that we had never seen Askren in such a bad position. Ben's resilience, however, would pull him through, working his way to the cage and taking Robbie down to his territory. In the scramble, Robbie would end up in a bulldog choke, and well to me, the ref, Askren, and everybody else, Robbie appeared to go unconscious. The fight was called off and Askren was declared the winner, but it wasn't so cut and dry. Immediately after being let go, Robbie sprung up protesting the stoppage. He wasn't out, or so now it appeared. Both Robbie and Dana White wanted an immediate rematch to settle a controversial ending. He'd, he'd like the, the Till Masvidal winner in London. Um, we we, we want to do the fight again, so we'll figure it out. But Asgrin wasn't having any of it. He had his tickets and he was off to London, there to find hype for a potential fight between him and his next opponent. Considering the way it ended, would you be open to a rematch? Not really. I mean, I didn't really want to fight him in the first place. I like Robbie Lawler a lot. You know, what's the point? So I'm going to go to London. Uh, Till versus Masvidal, that's like three versus six, three versus seven. I think the winner of that's probably going to be top three. Uh, and that's who I'd like to fight. Ben understood the fight game and was fully conscious of the fact that in order to propel himself towards the title, he had to generate so much hype for a potential matchup with the winner of Till vs Masvidal that it would drown out the cries for a rematch against Lawler. The last thing that Askren wanted was taking an unnecessary step backward and potentially leaving the UFC broken before ever getting close to the title. He entered the UFC knowing he had three fights. A rematch wasn't an option. All the trash talk, Twitter beefs and corny promotion that made Ben up was in stark contrast with one half of the main event in London. Jorge Masvidal, who felt that trash talk was childish, pathetic and was ruining the sport. Jorge was less than impressed with the fact that Askren was trying to worm his way out of a fight with Robbie also. You see the replay and you see that he has a thumbs up. I never seen somebody sleeping like that. I would say, let's do it again. I'm gonna f you up without a doubt, show it to the world. But he's a weasel. He's a punk here already. Before they even brought that up, he said, no, not a chance, not doing it. Why? Why? Because you're not Man, you're a punk, and the bitch in you will be brought out. Thinks you need to, to rematch Robbie Lawler. Is that what he's bringing up with you, or just general Listen, trash talk? The, the, the reason he's saying that, and every other welterweight is saying that, is because they don't want me to be on their dance card next. Isn't it obvious? You think, you think, do you really think, can you really tell me, John Morgan, that George Masvidal is so passionate about Robbie Lawler's career that he needs me to go take that fight again. Ultimately, Ben wanted Darren to win the fight. In his eyes, and probably a lot of fans, Jorge was a journeyman and destined to lose to the hometown hero. And so when provided with the opportunity by the UFC to be a part of a Q&A session, Askren didn't hold back, making himself the heel to the UK crowd. He wanted to generate as much noise as possible when it came to him versus Till. He's here to cause problems, to make some noise. That's what funky Ben Askren does, we know that. Oh! Hey! Darren Till, Darren Till, Darren Till. If Darren Till is too scared to get in the ring with me, I guess I'll have to find a new opponent. Blah, 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 blah. And you guys are dipshits and you're booing me. Well, Ben, how's it going? As uh, the 21st century, take off the boot cut jeans and flip flops, you fat. You look like a beanbag with arms and legs. Go f yourself. When I hear tick that there's tick a tick lot of English tick inbreeding, all I have to do is look at you. Miners, baby. Boom roasted. The hype for a matchup between the American Ben and the British Till was undeniable. But as with all things in this sport, it never quite goes the way most expect. Darren Till was on a huge come up touted as one of the greatest prospects the sport had ever seen. He was charismatic, undefeated, and put on technical and flashy fights. He quickly found himself in title contention against Tyron Woodley, but it's that very performance that he fell short. He didn't quite look himself, timid and afraid to engage. Most chalked it up to the moment getting to the young fighter, thrusted quickly to the top echelon of the sport, but that ascension was probably too fast. He would lose to a submission in the second round, 
but it was no small feat. Till was still one of the best fighters in the world, and he was very young in the game. The matchup against Jorge was considered a wash. Masvidal was hit or miss, and could never really pull off a meaningful win streak to get him towards the title. Whilst he was certainly entertaining, he was destined to fade out of the sport, never really quite making it. This was Till's comeback, this was Till's moment, and this was Till's home crowd. Even the odds had placed Jorge as a plus 175 underdog, but Masvidal was holding a card close to his chest. A transcendental experience on a reality TV show, it placed him in a jungle, alone away from technology, nothing but his thoughts. All that accompanied him was the silent musings of his career that had been marred by split decision after split decision. And there, in that quietude, a new reality dawned on him, one where he would no longer be the victim of judges destroying careers. The Masvidal that returned from that jungle was different, born anew, and Till was the first would-be victim of this rebirth. I got a lot of nerves, I got scared. I like being scared. Is Jorge the right opponent to get you in that frame of mind? Do, do you do you respect his game? Do you, do you, is he a dangerous opponent? Is there a potential he's going to catch you and knock you out? Is that realistic? Yeah. Oh! If you shot, hey, come on. Give him the three piece with the soda, and he just glide out of there. And some of his friends tried to suck him up. Masvidal shocked the UK, and to be honest, the whole of the UFC fan base. Seeing Darren Till unconscious after receiving a violent barrage from Jorge was jaw dropping. I became a fan after witnessing that brutal KO, and for me, Ben Askren's escapade onto British soil was really the icing on the cake. I watched all the interviews, the Q&A, the tweets and the fight week spectacle. Askren didn't miss the opportunity. When shown to the UK crowd over the stadium's monitors, he was showered in booze. The audience hated him. But then he unzipped his coat and revealed a t-shirt saying, curly headed fuck. He wore their insults like armour. The crowd erupted into cheers. They loved it. And I think all things considered from Jorge's unexpected win to Ben Askren's relentless self-promotion, we knew what the next fight would be, and it was guaranteed to be entertaining. A clash of philosophies. One man who had been raised on the violent streets of Miami, where any disrespect was met with physical force, and the other, a squeaky clean collegiate athlete and Olympian, who felt that trash talk was a playful endeavour to sell tickets. The real fighting to be done in side of the cage. Hello everybody, I'm back stateside, enjoying my little vacation, you know, and I'm coming back. I got these two little sluts, you might know them or you might not. One's not in the top 10 and the other one that is hasn't got a victory in the UFC, didn't make the dude tap Robbie Lawler and didn't put him to sleep, but you think you have a win in the UFC. Who, who are you fooling? You can fool the crowd, but you can't fool me, playboy. George, I think I might have not said this in a language that you understand. Tell the people, are you scared? He doesn't want to fight me because he's scared. Dana would deliver onto the fans the fight everyone wanted to see. UFC 239 in the summer of 2019 would promise violence and a pre-fight build-up for the ages. You're fake as f You're selling something to the public that is not there, obviously. And you're a coward. Let's throw that in there too. And if people don't believe me, tune in July 6th. I'll show you how much of a coward he is. Yeah, they need to keep the idiot away from me. I mean, I'm, I'm paid to fight in the octagon. We can do it for 15 minutes. And I don't want any, any chances that he's going to do something stupid before the fight and ruin it. He just wants validation. He wants to be accepted, you know? I think half of what he's doing is corny on purpose. All that boom roasted shit. Come on, man. Boom roasted. Boom roasted. Boom roasted. There is no way in God's green earth this guy could do anything to me. It's totally impossible. I will do whatever I want to this person. I will dominate them. I will humiliate them. So it's one of those, can he impose his will? Can he get a hold of you? You're gonna get a hold of these fucking nuts, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's good. He's just not good enough. Oh, you the double What's up, boss? Yeah, I just kicked the what, man? Uh, yeah. Yeah, man. I can't wait. I can't wait to break your face, baby. Woo! We found out he's he's a specialist at putting his face in other men's crotch. So that's what we're gonna try to stop is uh, for him not to sniff my crotch the whole fight, you know? His muscles aren't very big and his beard's pretty ugly. But besides that, I think it's gonna be total domination. Uh, he doesn't upset me. I'm, I'm happy I'm gonna get paid to correct that mistake that has been asked for.
I saw some criticism. People say the punches weren't really necessary. Maybe they were super necessary. You know, I, I remember being in the cage with them. I don't really remember the flying name, but I kind of the first thing I remember then. I was in the hospital um, and I woke up. I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm like, oh, I'm in the no. hospital. I don't feel sore. I'm like, this didn't go very well, did it? And oh. she goes, nah. And I'm like, it was pretty fast, huh? MMA is a tangle of destinies, an interwoven mesh of beautiful and intriguing possibilities. The interlinked cage promises fates to collide, one ultimately doomed, and the other becomes infused with its energies. Nothing is created nor destroyed. As above, so below. Ben Askren, despite retirement, despite refusing to bow down to Dana, and despite the destruction of his hips, had made his way to the UFC, and with a win over Jorge, was guaranteed a title shot. Jorge, a journeyman who had returned from a spiritual awakening in the depths of a jungle, destroyed Darren Till in his hometown, and with a win over Askren, was also guaranteed a title shot. Ben had somewhat defined the first half of 2019. He was what everyone talked about. His fight with Jorge was unofficially the main event. Askren was the story, and in five seconds, all of the fame, hype, and promotional effort had all transferred to Street Jesus himself. What had amazed people even more in the aftermath was that Masvidal, in some mockery of reality, had manifested this moment, planting the seeds for a baptism over many encounters, and no one even caught it. All of fight week had been put in his arms behind his back a non-threatening gesture, one we had seen in London before he delivered a three-piece and a soda. The simple fact was, it was a lure, lulling his enemy into a false sense of safety. But underneath that guise was a plan, a sequence of synapse explosions etched into Jorge's nervous system. He had been drilling a flying knee throughout fight camp. It was all a part of his plan. The fact that it paid off was just unbelievable, and there are no amount of words that can describe this moment. It was just simply perfect. Two careers worth of hype, lows and highs, championships, backstreet brawls, an existential crisis of meaning beneath a humid canopy, and a trade for the ages, all on a crash course to the fastest knockout in UFC history. The aftermath was insane. The flying knee transcended the sport, billions of views, millions of gifts, years later and it still remains in the zeitgeist of this sport. It was, and always will be, one of the greatest moments this sport has ever seen. Unfortunately, it was Ben Askren who was on the wrong side of that exchange. Jorge became a superstar and Askren was placed at a divisive fork in the road. His hips were eroding every fight camp, and the title just got even further away. The question was, how was I going to deal with it? I had always taken everything I could from a loss to make it mean something. I dealt with setbacks throughout high school whilst wrestling early on at Mizu, and finally at the Beijing Olympics. All of them sucked. You think you're really good until somebody proves otherwise, leaving you only one real course of action. Get back to work and get better fix what went wrong. My failures at each stop became my strengths as I went through my competitive life. They were necessary, because I made damn sure to see them that way. It's a cliche in fighting that too many don't actually believe, but the idea is to learn from every failure. If anything was revealing about Askren's dismantling of his loss, it was that he was the same guy win or loss. Despite all the emotions that certainly came with losing at such a pivotal moment, Askren remained matter of fact and strictly business. He lost, but he still had millions of other things in his life to be grateful for. His family at the forefront of that. When is the last time you recall losing on a big stage? The last time would be the Olympics. Wow. And how does this yeah, compare? I mean, it, not nearly as painful. I think I probably have so many other things going on in my life. Whereas when I was training for the Olympics, it was like the Olympics. Wrestling. That's, that's it. That's, that's all I thought about. I mean, I might have went and socialized or chased girls. I might have went to school, but all that shit was easy. All that shit was secondary. Everything in my life was solely focused on wrestling. And that, that was it all day, every single day. And, and now, like I said, my life is much more diversified. Askren wasn't one to sit around and wallow in sadness. And just over a month later, he announced that he would be fighting in the main event of UFC Singapore against Damian Meyer. The fight would take place in August, just three months after being knocked out. Quick turnarounds in this sport never really end well. I never like them, especially following a brutal knockout. And well, for Ben, it was no different. After a back and forth fight with sloppy striking and great grappling transitions, Askren got caught in a rear naked choke and was put to sleep by Meyer. In just a short year, Askren had gone from 
from one of the greatest what-ifs in the sport to being on the receiving end of what amounted to three performances that painted Askren as a mid-tier fighter. Yes, he was a dominant fighter outside of the UFC, but inside the octagon he was put to shame by the top echelon of his division. That five second knockout was the salt in the wound, but what people didn't see, nor really ever take into account, was the plethora of issues Askren faced outside of the cage. The reality was that he should never have come out of retirement in the first place. His body wasn't fit to drop straight into the sharks at the top of the premier organisation. Dana White, in a lot of ways, robbed Askren of his chance to prove his worth, and waited until he was a shell of himself before pulling him in. After the loss, Askren faded into the shadows, from a man who took shots on social media any chance he could, to a faint whisper in the background of the fight game as he reflected on his first brutal year in the UFC. As 2019 drew to a close, Ben reached out to the media to make an announcement. I think it's fairly obvious what I'm going to say. Um, I'm retiring from the sport of mixed martial arts and frankly I'm retiring from everything. We hit problems and I finally uh, had the discussion with my doctor and we got the, I got the, actually got the MRI before my last fight and I need a hip replacement. So, um, man, that, that, that's it for me. Uh, I've really just been filled with gratitude for how great of a career I've been able to have even though obviously in the end it did not turn out to go my way. It was no surprise that he retired. He gambled on himself, and it didn't pay off. It was kind of sad, really. When I think of Ben, I always imagine what could have been if he had been given the opportunity sooner. But could-haves and should-haves are unchangeable. What has been has been, and what's to come will come. Askren was done with the sport, or rather, his body was done with the sport. But his mark, permanent and everlasting. The biggest what-if, and the UFC's greatest failure. And so the siren song plays, a distant melody that calls retired fighters back to the fight game. The law, a big payday. Even Askren, one of the most cerebral fighters in the game, who should have known better than to be half in, half out, couldn't resist the subtle tug that money provides. Jake Paul was looking to add an actual fighter to his resume in an attempt to bolster a boxing career that had up until this point hinged on fighting well, nobody's with regards to actual fighting prowess. Whilst there was a slew of fighters who had put their name in the hat, Paul knew that the best option to legitimize his career was by taking on someone low risk, high reward. That came in the form of Askren. If Paul beat him, well, he just beat an actual world champion of MMA. No one could deny him after that, surely. Well, there was at least a small contingent of people who could read between the lines. Askren isn't a striker. Somehow in the murk of promotion, the frenzy and the excitement, people actually managed to convince themselves that Askren stood some kind of chance against Paul. A man who genuinely looked good, was an athlete in his own right, and who had dedicated his life solely to the sport of boxing for the last few years. Askren on the other hand had been in the sport for over a decade and had relentlessly tried to get better at striking to no avail. His Damian Meyer performance indicative of the lack of innate skill Ben possessed in terms of boxing. People were so convinced that Paul was a fraud and had no right in the space, they chalked Ben up as the man to expose Paul. Even Dana White, a man who actively scouts talent and watched more fights than any of us can care to imagine, bet a million dollars on Askren. But I feel like those more honest with themselves saw the fight for what it was. An almost 40 year old bloke who had retired from competition because his body couldn't handle the relentless nature of the sport was a lamb being led to slaughter and along the way Askren was wrung dry for all of the promotion he was capable of. During the fight the commentators, which included people like Snoop Dogg, wiped the floor with Ben saying things like he had a body like Vince Vaughn and that he was built like a bag of milk. Two minutes into the fight and Snoop Dogg, who had placed a sizable bet on Paul to win the fight, started to scream over the rest of the commentators make my money Jake and well the rest is history it was a weird stoppage but a stoppage it was Ben had come out of retirement lost to a youtuber and well in his own words it all kind of sucked it is unfortunate I thought I really did think I, I could do better it's um, yeah that was not fun I feel that unfortunately, as the sun sets on Ben Askren's career, he'll be remembered for his less than successful tenure inside the octagon. Most fans, either ignorant or simply unaware of the eminence that came before, an undefeated multi-organisation world champion, an Olympian, NCAA Division 1 great of wrestling. The man has more awards, wins, success and money than most athletes could ever dream of, but that sour ending, exemplified by a devastating loss to Jake Paul, seems to be the rhetoric that trudges with him slowly into retirement. 
in a lot of ways the purpose of this video was to highlight all that had come before and to champion what Ben should really be remembered for. A dominant fighter who was snubbed of the main stage for far too long by a man who chose entertainment over competition. And whilst Funky did find his home in one championship, an organisation that ultimately chooses the sport and spirit of martial arts over what sells, he still knew in the back of his mind competition inside the UFC was the final frontier. Whilst Askren did eventually enter the eight-sided cage, it was probably far too late, a body worn down by the brutal weathering of this sport, his athletic capability waning in the twilight of his career. 2019 didn't serve Ben well, those three fights almost a joke to a lot of fans, and it's a shame, but it's also just the nature of this sport. One minute you're the greatest, an athlete capable of anything, and the next your body is cracking under the pressure of a game that demands nothing but perfection out of its participants. And perhaps we put too much expectation on these men who give it all. Perhaps this sport is simply a young man's game. What's more surprising is that Ben wasn't consumed in bitterness towards Dana from blocking his career all those years. He was just thankful for the opportunity, and although he stumbled, at least he was allowed to stumble. For a lot of people, it's the attitude of Ben that will always punctuate the legacy he leaves behind. A stern, nonchalant attitude that could be summarised into a simple phrase things happen. Win or loss, he is always critical, but more than ready to move past it. He always goes home to the most important thing to him, and that's his family. His wrestling academies are full of students still hungry to learn from one of the best wrestlers of this generation. As we navigate life, it's easy to be caught up in the frenzy of our own goals. We are all striving valiantly towards achievement, our ambitions leading us astray, making all matters of life fade into the periphery. That singular point that we covet becomes an obsession, and whether it's family, friends, or our own health, they are left to the wayside. That's not what life is about. Askren shows us that if it's being the recipient of the fastest knockout in UFC history or being clipped by some YouTuber, life is bigger than the sum of our desires. Getting closer with nature and our loved ones guarantees there is something meaningful when we fail. Many people wondered why he was smiling hand in hand with his wife as he walked from the ring after the Jake Paul loss. But now, after it's all said and done, you might understand it's not money it's not the thrill of competition, it's that he knows life always has and always will continue to move on. Was it a dumb idea to come back for that last little ladle of humiliation? Hell no. It was kind of like the wrestling days during my senior year. You think he can beat me? Let's do it. I wasn't scared to jump into an unknown situation to see how it might play out. I didn't have my ego tied to the outcome. The whole experience was fun up until I fucking lost. That part sucked. As for diminishing my legacy, I honestly think that a lot of people are just tapping into their own emotions and feelings about how embarrassed they would be in that situation and trying to put it on me. Money wasn't the reason. I did it because that's who I am. If I was exposed by taking one last chance, so be it. I can proudly say I've never known any other way.